I'm JP Vassar. Uh, I'm a Cisco Fellow, uh, VP of Engineering for MLAI. I've been driving MLAI at Cisco for about a decade now. I've been at Cisco for longer than that. And I'm not going to talk about just the technology, but products, because we're shipping. That's why it's a little bit of a special day, a special week, should I say, because we are launching two products using this predictive technology. All right, so with that, um, I'd like to start by saying a few things about MLAI. Uh, why being skeptical about MLAI? Um, you know, what I believe is that we, we are seeing a little bit of two camps now, you know, a camp of people who believe that it has to be based on MLAI, otherwise this is uninteresting. And then you have another camp that says, oh, it's buzzword and there's nothing real. And we know that, of course, the truth is in the middle. So I just wanted to share with you that our approach at Cisco has been to be very pragmatic. And we don't believe that AI ML is the right technology for every single use case by all means. We learned the hard way, to be honest with you. We started the journey some time ago. I share a bit of uh, the history of ML AI at Cisco in a few minutes. Uh, but I think that we have developed a very unique expertise in the ability to detect and very, very early on whether ML AI is the right technology and how to make it scale. Because doing a proof of concept is always easy, but making it run at scale is different. And of course, we'll finish up this uh, talk with a live demo and nothing recorded is fully live. And so I'll show you what we can do with this technology. So just to go back a little bit, and I don't want to bother you too much with that, but that's uh, something we started off um, a long time ago. Uh, as I said, more than 12 years now with the IoT, very quickly we moved to uh, security. And of course, security is top of mind. We're still using a lot of ML AI in security. So that was called self-learning networks. And I think that I presented at the tech field day at that time. And the idea was to use ML at the edge of a network. We look at the, the behavior of users so that we can detect zero day attacks. In 2016, we developed the first uh, cloud based on ML AI, Cisco uh, AI platform that is being used uh, these days by multiple use cases. That was mostly for Wi-Fi. So if you guys remember, it's called Cisco AI Network Analytics. And the goal is to use the Wi-Fi telemetry so that we can learn what is normal versus abnormal. So in this case, you know, if you look at this band, what the system does in a nutshell, we gather the telemetry from the wireless controller, the APs. We look at multiple parameters like the RSSI and the, the number of users, the type of application, and we tell you what should be the throughput, for example, or what should be the, the rate of failure when you roam, or what should be the time to join the network that is expected according to the, you know, the, the situation, if you will, that we are facing. And then we do some root causing and things like that. We now have thousands of customers on this platform. And then we worked on something called Cisco AI Endpoint Analytics. I don't know if that rings a bell, but that's something we announced uh, two years ago. And the idea was to say, can I use ML to classify and recognize, especially in the IoT world, for example, you want to recognize um, whether it's an iPhone or a printer and things like that. And then you, you are taking the NetFlow uh, records from a device that claims to be an iPhone to verify that this is the behavior of an iPhone. So it's a simple classifier that says, look, the guy claims to be an iPhone, but that's not really the behavior of an iPhone. And so there must be a spoofing uh, attack, if you will. So that was our journey so far. I'm going fast because I really want to go to the point of predictive. And here we are. So we started this, uh, you know, uh, initiative about uh, three years ago now. The goal at the time was to say, is there a way to learn so that we can predict issues before they happen? That as simple as that. And we had a, you know, a lot of people were uh, skeptical about that to start with, which I believe is a good sign when you're trying to do a disruptive innovation. Um, because many people thought that the internet was unpredictable. And the only thing we could do was to react but there was nothing that could be predicted so that we could avoid issues before they happen. So let me say a few words um, about that. So if you look at the, the past 35 years almost, 
And I know that you're not a shy audience, so you probably uh, jump on me if you disagree, which is totally fine, by the way. Um, we have been doing a lot of reactive stuff. Uh, personally, I spent years on MPLST fast reroute, uh, you know, optical restoration and things like that. So it used to take minutes to converge upon detecting an issue. Then it was seconds and then milliseconds. And today we know that we can probably achieve a few milliseconds in order to react. Uh, we, whether it's IP fast reroute or MPLST fast reroute. Um, but still, this is reactive. And when you think about it, there's no system that is capable of learning from the past so that we can anticipate issues before they happen. And that was our mandate. So the way we started, and I can tell you that we learned the hard way, um, was really to say, I'm not going to jump on a mathematical model. I will look at the data. So for about one year, we analyzed millions of paths across the internet and thousands of service providers. And the goal was to say, is there a signal in the telemetry that could be used in order to predict an issue that is about to happen? Um, and of course, the goal was, you know, by no means to replace the reactive mechanism. You know, the goal is to say, for some issues, and I'll tell you more about the numbers, can I predict the issues before they happen? If I cannot, then I will fall back to reactive mechanism. And so this is really complementary. So that was the first goal. The second goal was to say, as much as we love the layer three, can we uh, look a little bit at the layer seven so that what I mean by issue is also a SLA violation for the application. So what I'm trying again to predict, and you probably heard of gray, brown failures, whatever you call it, uh, is to say, well, unless the path goes down, you are, you're stuck to the same path. Is there a way to detect some SLA violations so that we switch to another path? And when I say switch, I really mean to switch before we start uh, encountering the issue. And you'll see the demo in a few minutes, so we're going to go live with that. The last but not least was self-feeling. And I think the industry has been talking about self-feeling for, I don't know, a decade, something like that. And of course, we all know that there's a bit of lack of trust sometimes in automation. People are a bit uh, on the fence. And so we thought, OK, if we are making predictions, we want to make sure that we don't have any false positive. And we all know that when we are making prediction from time to time, we are wrong about the prediction. So what I found really interesting is when you design the machine learning algorithm, you always have a tension between what I call precision and recall. And if you're trying to predict everything, you're going to be wrong many times. If you're not trying to predict everything, but you want to be right, you're going to predict a bit less, if you will. But this is the right trade-off. So our mandate was, if we make a recommendation, it must be right all the time. And when we started, we had no idea whether we could predict 5% of all issues, 50%, 20%. What we knew was that in the internet, we, we were not predicting anything. So we started at zero. And I, you know, I always said to my team, I'm OK if we only predict 5% of all issues. But I want to make sure that when we predict, we're right. That was really the mandate. OK, so I'm going to show you the use case. It's uh, fairly simple. So this predictive technology is SaaS based in the cloud. And um, the way to trigger it, basically, is that, first of all, you don't need any hardware, any software. So this engine that is uh, in the cloud connects automatically with the analytics. Um, so if you are running SD-WAN, uh, Viptela, and you have the analytics, all we need to do is to connect to the analytics in the cloud, and we start gathering you know, the, uh, the engine with the telemetry. I'll go back to what type of telemetry in a minute. Now, the job of this algorithm is if you look at that screen and you have a branch office, and you have multiple paths to go to, let's say, Office 365 or WebEx or other destinations with supporting dozens of applications, what you want to do is to start predicting the probability of SLA violation. And we define SLA violation with some templates on the delay, the loss, and the jitter. So what this algorithm does is by ingesting the telemetry coming from the analytics, look at all the possible paths 
to this application like WebEx or Office 365. And what it will do is to output the probability of SLA violation for every single path. So what you do, we look at the policy. And let's say that you, you have a policy that says, I want to use MPLS for voice. If we see that there's, there is an alternate path and the probability of having a set of violation is, is significantly higher on the current path, and we predict a, a significant amount of traffic, we issue a recommendation and we say, OK, you're using a given policy for this site and this application. We think that you'd better off changing the policy and move to a different path because there is significant amount of traffic that could be saved from having a SLA violation. That's what the tool does. That's awesome, but it might interfere with other applications, right? So if I'm going to change path, um, it might interfere with another application where you then have to say you have to change path as well. So aren't you, how do you make sure that you're not interfering with those other apps? apps? So we're not, so there are multiple things we can do. We can start playing with QoS, for example, take into account the QoS, if you will. But for now, we make the assumption that the, the QoS policy will, be, will handle the prioritization on the second path, but we could do that. We could also look at uh, the percentage of traffic that you want to shift, you want to avoid oscillation and all these things. The reason why this is very easy for us is because this is centralized. So there's only one engine, if you will, that makes the decision to switch and when to switch and where. And we can look at the capacity that we have left and all these things. And it's an advice that you give for now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So thank you for, for this question. Um, when we started, uh, we thought, OK, we're going to go full steam on automation. And many customers said, hey, this is fantastic, but wait a minute. <laughs> I want to see the, you know, the output. So most of the algorithm uh, customers, sorry, what they do, they look at the predictions. And what you see in the demo is that you can check whether the prediction was correct. We want to see to be also to be transparent. And when we make a mistake that can happen, we show it. And the accuracy is 99.6%. So you can assess that. And then you could decide when you want to make it automatic or not next time. Does that make sense? Yep. OK, super. So JP, I got a question. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it, it's centrally managed, yes. and you notify the devices that they need to change path. Uh, do you do it like holistically? So it's not only just one uh, device you change path on, but you do it all the way from the network from an application perspective? Yes, totally. That's what we do. What we, we do, though, is that for now, you know, it's a, it's a, you're going to see that we have two products, right? One is the analytics. And so you, have, you will have a tab that says predicting networks. When you click on it, you see all the recommendations. And that's all we do. And in the second step, you will be able to say, oh, by the way, this recommendation you know, sounds uh, good to me. I want to apply it. And then it will go to vManage and close the loop automatically. And it does that for all the sites at the same time, looking at the holistic view. Yeah. Sure. OK, so I won't bother you too much with that slide, because I may be the only one uh, excited about it. But in a nutshell, we've been using many approaches in the past. So statistic, statistical models, and they work beautifully well. Some people sometimes, when you say statistical models, they say, oh, is it real ML or is it real AI? I don't think we care. We care about the outcome. So that's what we do for long-term recommendation. We looked at uh, our old model for short term. What do I mean by long term is um, short term would be in, for the next uh, 6, 12, 24 hours. And, but of course, the problem is that you need to be in front of the screen and say, oh, there will be an issue in six hours. What am I supposed to do? So it's more appropriate when you have full automation. What we do now is the long term approach. So what the tool does is to say, for the next few weeks, based on what I've learned from the past, I can tell you that you're better off moving, changing your policy, because the current path is likely to have way more SLA violation than the one that I recommend. And you can check whether it's correct or not, of course. But we looked at the many things uh, in the domain of machine learning, LSTM, and all that kind of models, but I will skip that for the moment. Uh, of course, always happy to discuss with you offline about these models. So the architecture is fairly simple. Um, as I said, we have this engine in the cloud. We're building a massive data lake. 
and the data lake could be fed with uh, V Analytics, Meraki, and also Thousand Eyes, obviously. Um, and then what we do is that we build a common data model on top and the algorithm they run on top of this infrastructure. So this way, there's no dependency. You know, if we change a little bit the telemetry or we have another source of telemetry, we don't need to retrain the models. Now, the very cool stuff, because Tom mentioned about cool technology, so I need to, to mention cool stuff, is we also have some information about the application behavior, none the least of which is Microsoft Office 365. So if you sign up for that, it's already available. Every 10 minutes, we would get some feedback from the layer 7 of Microsoft to say, good, degraded, or bad. And we take that into account when we're making our prediction. That's something we can do in addition to the probe. But for now, we're using the BFD probe that you guys, and CXP probes that you, you know well. So uh, just one question yeah. to that. So uh, of course, it makes sense to integrate these first. I see them as low hanging fruit when it comes to gathering analytics, but your model would work also for other, let's say, environments. As long as you get the data points out, could be a different method how you gather these data points, but could be implemented for other technologies as yes. well. Yeah? You're absolutely right. Um, it's sometimes a lot of work, though, because you need to understand the telemetry. Sometimes people, when they measure the CPU usage, the bandwidth, they're not using the same time scale, the same yeah. variety. So there's a bit of work on that stuff. The product is is on Cisco SD1 for now, but technically speaking, you're absolutely right. Yeah, but it's always the same. You need data normalization, absolutely. and then you can apply the AI. Absolutely but right. I see that in in general it could be applied in the future then for, you're right. I don't know, maybe even switches or whatever, where oh. you can get the right data absolutely. points out. Yeah. So thank you, by the way, because this is my last slide. So this way, you know, I can say 30 seconds. Um, yes, we, you know, the way I, I do see it is we wanted to start with low hanging fruit, as you said. We know the one is, is usually problematic and, um, and more challenging. So that's where we started, but you could apply it to SASE how to find the best pop, how to predict the best pop, the best pop to the best pop. What about hybrid work? You know, working from home, is it 4G that you should be using instead of Wi-Fi? And what can you learn from the past? It could be about optical. We're looking at that as well. Can we predict some degradation of a laser uh, on rooted optical networks? So the sky is the limit. So that's why we announced it as a, as a journey. And the first milestone is this product. You're absolutely right. I got a quick question. Do you take in third-party um, telemetry, for example, BGP route updates? Uh, recently, there's been outages. Um, so it would be nice to have that kind of fed into the system so you can reroute around it. Yeah, um, so that's a, that's a great point. We, for now, you know, the way the tool is working, if you will, is to predict for the next few weeks ahead. We don't want to overreact because then we have a reactive mechanism to switch. Mm -hmm. So. You know, we have a reactive mechanism that takes care of what is happening in time, and we have this guy looking at long term. So that's why they don't, uh, you know, they don't interfere, if you will. So I skip very quickly the telemetry because that's the SD1 telemetry that you guys know well. I just wanted to show you one slide, and then we go to the demo because we want to make sure we are on time. Um, there are many ways to show your results, and I'm over cautious about sharing. Uh, metrics, you, you guys remember the number of uh, maximum number of uh, routers in OSPF area, we said 50, and it was there for 20 years. So, but it's just to give you a rough idea. So in this case, what we have done is that we looked at the 60 customer networks, 3,000 cities, and we looked at the maximum number of users with SLA violation. And you can see that it was up to 40,000. If I sum up all of them, if you had followed the recommendations of the, of the tool, you could have reduced by 10,000. So in other words, it's about 20, 25% of SLA violation that would have been avoided by the tool. And I can tell you, I was very pleased with this result because even if it had been you know, 5% with very, very high accuracy, I was like, okay, why, avoiding five, why not avoiding 5%? But we, we think that we are more around 20, 25. Okay, we wanna go to demo. Um, and I'm skipping all of that. If you want to see a bit more in terms of white papers and things like that, we have some technology white papers, not related to products, but I'm going to switch to demo. Okay, so 
because I'm experienced, I need to be closer to, to, to the screen, otherwise I don't see it. Um, okay, so what I'm showing you, we really have two products today. One is one insight, thousand eyes, one insight. So the predictive networking technology was invented at Cisco. And then the first product to use it is thousand eyes, which is really great. We're very excited about that. The second one is the analytics. I won't have the time to show you both of them, but the UIs are a bit different. Uh, as you can see, I can show the demo with either V Analytics or Thousand Eyes One Insight. The GA is next month. So what do we see? So I'm going to randomly pick up some uh, recommendations. So here, each card is a recommendation from the tool that was issued some time ago. You see that for some of them, it could have been a, a week ago, it could have been three months ago. So what do we see here? So if I select, uh, let me see, maybe I can take this one. So in this case, of course, everything is anonymized. Sorry about that, but this is a real network. We are live, by the way. It's not uh, something uh, fake or in a lab. What I see is that the recommendation is to move from business internet MPLS to bronze MPLS. So what you see is the percentage of time within SLA. So this is what we call default. And what we call recommended is the new recommendation that we're making. So basically we're saying, as of today, with the current policy for this site, we see 17 uh, users. We, we, uh, we see that uh, the percentage of time within SLA is 69%. And if you follow this recommendation and you move to bronze, you would increase by 17%. So let's go a little bit deeper now. So I'm on that side. I can have a look at multiple paths. So in this example, what do you see? So here, you see that you have two paths that can be used. You see the bronze and MPLS, and you see these two dots here. So what we're basically saying is that today, you are using three paths, business internet, bronze, and MPLS. We recommend you to stop using business internet. This is the, the blue one. And of course, you may say, yeah, but show me why. You know, I want to verify that indeed there are some issues on this path. So you can go back and look at that. OK, it's just one example. What do you see here? You see that there was a spike of packet loss to 18%. Uh, so this is the blue guy, right? Remember? So this blue guy is the path not to use, but we said you should st stop using. And indeed, there was a spike here. I can go back again. And I'm just going randomly, by the way, right? I'm not uh, cherry picking anything. Look, there was another spike here, as you can see. Oh, look at that one. That one is beautiful. What you can see is that between uh, 11 p.m. ish and 8 a.m. that day, look at the spike of, of loss. This is typically the, the type of pattern that is learned by the tool. And the recommendation in this case was made uh, some time ago, it was October 27. So today is February 7. And that recommendation was made back in October to say you should stop using this, 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 you know, this path. And you see why. And you can check the KPIs. I'll try to see if I can find a voice one. Let me see. Oh, yes, we do have a voice one. So that one was issued 13 days ago. Uh, we believe that we can improve the percentage of time within SLA by 4%, as you can see. And I can go back in time, and I can do exactly the same thing. You know, so for this guy, we say the default uh, is 64%. You can increase to 100%. You can click on it, and you can check the KPIs and look at that. So the one we are telling you to avoid, the red guy, look at the packet loss. You see the spikes? This is the path for which we say, stop using it. And I could stay with you for a long time and go through many, many of these examples. Once again, they are available both in the analytics and in one insight. Um, so if the, the customer chooses to accept that recommendation, can they just one click from there and just do it straight away? Excellent uh, 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 you know, question. It will be coming in the next release. So in this release, this is all, we are only showing the recommendation. Next release, you can click on it. And we may expand to say, 
it's not black or white. You know, I, I want to accept the policy, but only for some sites, for some traffic, for some applications. So you have more granularity, if you will. And will that next release just still have that kind of manual interaction? Yes. Or would it, is there an option to go fully automated as well? Yes, absolutely. So the, the goal is exactly that, is to say, no, I only want to make it, you know, uh, another control of the user, or I want to make it automatic, but only for some, it's being decided as we speak, but this is the plan for now. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. For me, the question when I see something like this, like this is always, um, the path you're on right now is not as good as the, the other one that you have. Yeah. But what if changing to that path will make it as bad as the other one? Because maybe uh, the path you're having right now is bad because there's users on them. And if you move them to the other path, this one gets yeah. bad. No, no, we take that into account. Um, so in other words, you can do, there's a lot of things you can do, right? But the goal of the statistical modeling is to take into account what will happen when you start moving uh, you know, traffic. Um, you can also, you know, it's very interesting that what we saw also was that in some cases, the tool would not make any recommendation. You're like, why? Because we have some issues. It's just because there was not enough capacity. There was no alternative, if you will. And that's why the tool was just not saying anything. So what we are planning to do maybe at some point is to show you some issues, show you you can predict and say, you know what? I just don't have any alternate path. So that's why. So that's, that's the type of uh, things we're working on as we speak as well. Yeah, I have, I have also a follow-up question, yeah? So this is great, and I think for, for, for the moment you can do very good with this model, analytics, baseline, and then apply a change that improves your traffic thing. The future, I would like to hear a bit from the future. What I see is a lot of the bursts that we having problems in the network are very short, yeah? Do you see that this will evolve to a point where you have kind of this very interactive in one second, you route this traffic over, remove it back so that it becomes more dynamic model? We have something you might have noticed that I talked about real time prediction. And so that's what we are looking at as we speak to say, can I react within a few seconds? But of course, when you do that, you need to take care of stability at the same time, because you may have oscillations and all that sort of things. So, we are investigating, but we are a bit cautious. Um, if you want to have a very, very short sneak peek before people jump on me because I'm over time, we are looking at uh, you know, something absolutely fantastic uh, as well, which is how do I understand the user experience, which has been such a big problem. And uh, if I got a chance to go back to tech field, maybe I can tell you a bit more about this. This is called cognitive networks, uh, and that's going to be complementary to predictive.